Yeah, I'll react to that, sure. Okay. Okay. All right. Let's go. Um, Real Engineering, really nice channel. My name is Connor, if you are new. And uh, I'm here to learn, apparently. Uh, okay, how a single Swedish submarine defeated the U.S. Navy. <clears throat> Let's go. Uh, original link to the video, top of the description below. Right below that, link to the Discord. Click on it. Love to have you. Send you right over there. Uh, my name is Connor. Did I say that? Uh, my name is Connor. I live in Rhode Island, which is in New England, which is in the USA. Yeah. If you are not ready to learn, there's the door about this piece of fiction. There's No, I'm joking. Guys, I'm joking. I can't help myself. There's the door. Uh, home X down the hall. Uh, make me hot dog. Hamburger. Let's go. Ooh, they have a sponsor before they even go into it. Be one of the first 73 people to sign up with this link and get 20% off your subscription with Brilliant.org. Brilliant. I see them all over the time. Make sure he'll have an ad on it, I'm sure, to uh, click it. Click the link. It lets uh, Brilliant know that Real Engineering sent you, and uh, that helps them out. This episode of Real Engineering is brought to you by Brilliant, a problem-solving website that teaches you to think like an engineer. It's a bit bright The United behind. States military has the strongest and most diverse Navy in the world. The US military's fleet of aircraft carriers is so large, it makes the US Navy the second largest air force in the world, second only to the actual US Air Force. A single Nimitz class aircraft carrier like the USS Ronald Reagan, a $6.2 billion nuclear powered ship, can carry twice the aircraft as any other foreign carrier, which makes it even more shocking that it was sunk by a single diesel powered Swedish submarine during war games in 2005. A single oh. submarine that cost the same as a single F-35 at $100 million managed to sneak by an entire carrier task force with anti-submarine defenses to enter the red zone and score multiple torpedo hits on the US Ronald Reagan, sinking Phones it virtually. Away. Sorry guys, I'm being very annoying and, and I, I, I just I just want to go back like 10 seconds. A single submarine that cost the same as a single F-35 at $100 million managed to sneak by an entire carrier task force with anti-submarine defenses to enter the red zone and score multiple torpedo hits on the US Ronald Reagan, sinking it virtually before shrinking back into the vast ocean undetected. This was just one of many exercises where the Swedish Gotland class submarine proved too stealthy for the world's strongest navy. The new submarine How? proved so threatening that the US military leased the Swedish sub for an additional year to develop strategies to counter the silent threat. So what set the Gotland apart from other subs? The submarine's primary instrument to detect enemy subs is sonar. Sonar is essentially a finely tuned ear that works like a whale's or dolphin's echolocation to create a 3D map of the ocean around it. There is active sonar where the submarine will send out a sound pulse called a ping and listen for the reflections. But in warfare, this isn't a sound strategy as the ping is detected by enemies to give your exact location. So passive sonar is used where no ping is emitted and instead you simply listen. These electronic ears are so accurate that the nationality of submarines can be determined based on the operating frequency of the alternating current used in its power systems. And the 60 hertz alternating current of a US sub could be differentiated from the 50 hertz of European subs if the transformers and other electronics were not adequately insulated from the hull. The Swedes managed to I'm so sorry, guys. I, I, I. Operating frequency of the alternate accurate that the nationality of submarines can be determined based on the operating frequency of the alternating current used in its power systems. Okay. And the 60 hertz alternating current of a US sub could be differentiated from the 50 hertz of European subs if the transformers and other electronics were not adequately insulated from the hull. The Swedes managed to create a submarine so silent that it was practically undetectable by passive sonar. So how did they do this at such a low cost? The Gotland was the first submarine in the world to use a Stirling engine as its power generator. Stirling engines are not a new concept, with the first being created and patented by Robert Stirling in 1816, inspired by a series of high-pressure steam boiler explosions at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. Stirling wanted to create a safer engine that did not require such high pressures. I can't be arsed trying to animate this old drawing, so let's go for something simpler. He did this by creating a closed cylinder containing a fixed mass of gas permanently sealed within. 
Here, one side of the piston cylinder has a large buffer space, which allows for a relatively constant pressure on this side of the piston, while the other side fluctuates in pressure due to alternating heating cycles. When heat is applied to the outside of the cylinder, the pressure increases. So, so that means constant pressure on this side. The piston cylinder has a large buffer space. So, so that means uh, if if the um if there wasn't this buffer space on 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 either side and it was just that that rectangle right here um i hope you guys can see it just went straight down then the piston would move faster uh, on the bottom and they want it a, a more even speed and so they allowed space for the the compression to still not which allows for a relatively constant pressure on this side of the piston while the other side fluctuates in pressure due to alternating heating cycles. When heat is applied to the outside of the cylinder, the pressure increases, causing the piston to move until the pressure equalizes. Now, if we cool the outside of the cylinder with a heat exchanger, the pressure will drop and once again, the piston will move. This is our basic pressure cycle to create mechanical work, but this is an insanely inefficient. The outside of the cylinder with a heat exchanger, the pressure will drop and once again, the piston will move. This is our basic pressure cycle to create mechanical work, but this is an insanely inefficient system as most of the energy we put into the the system as heat is lost during the cooling cycle. Not to the gas, but the actual cylinder wall, which provides no mechanical work. Robert Sterling solved this by adding a displacer piston, which can drive the gas from one end of the cylinder to the other, allowing this end to be permanently hot and the other to be permanently cold. So the cylinder wall is no longer experiencing a temperature cycle. The pressure cycle here works slightly differently. First, the air on the hot end expands and causes the displacer to move into contact with the power piston, displacing more air from the cold end to be heated and expanded, allowing work to be done on the power piston. The air on the hot end now has nowhere to go and so is driven to the cold end, where it is cooled and contracts causing work to be done once again on the power piston. This is our new pressure cycle. The efficiency of this system can be increased further by placing what is essentially a heat battery in the tubes between the hot and cold cylinders. This conserves a huge amount of heat that would otherwise be wasted during the cooling cycle and gives the heat back to the air as it travels back through. Robert Sterling dubbed this the regenerator. Now we have the foundations of a useful engine. By incorporating a coolant system and a heating chamber, we create a larger temperature differential to drive the engine, and the efficiency can be further increased by increasing the number of tubes connecting the hot and cold spaces, along with the number of regenerators, and adding fins to increase the surface area of these tubes to allow for heat transfer. Did I say simplified? Sorry, I meant easier to read. Maybe I like the misery. Sterling engines ultimately fell into obscurity yeah. as... Um... I, I want to go through that again, but I'm I'm not going to make you watch all of it. Just, I'm going to cut it. Okay. And gives the heat back to the air as it travels back through. Robert Sterling dubbed this the regenerate and will sell them to hot end colands and your sweat and which all system When heat is applied to the other side fluctuates in pressure due to alternating heating cycles piston, while the other side fluctuates in pressure due to alternating heating cycles. When heat is applied to the outside of the cylinder, the pressure increases, causing the piston to move until the pressure. So when there's heat applied to the outside of the entire thing? Pressure is applied to the outside of the cylinder, the pressure increases, causing the piston to move until the pressure equalizes. Now, if we cool the outside of the cylinder, causing the piston to move until the pressure equalizes. Now, if we cool the outside of the cylinder with a heat exchanger, the pressure will drop and once again, the piston will move. Cool the outside of the cylinder with a heat exchanger, the pressure will drop and once again, the piston will move. This is our basic pressure cycle to create mechanical work, but this is an insanely inefficient system as most of the energy we put into the system as heat is lost during the cooling cycle. Not to the gas, but the actual cylinder wall, which provides no mechanical work. Robert Sterling solved this by adding a displacer piston. <sighs> Closed cylinder containing a fixed mass of gas permanently sealed within. Okay. Here, one side of the piston cylinder has a so large buffer space. 
which allows for a relatively constant pressure on this side of the piston, while the other side fluctuates in pressure due to alternating heating cycles. So this, they're both sides of the pistons are filled with, with. This side of the piston cylinder has a large buffer space, permanently similar. He did this by creating a closed cylinder containing a fixed mass of gas, permanently sealed within. Permanently sealed within, within just one side or on both sides, and. So there's gas sealed within the, the top of the piston. And just air below. And the... This thing down here, the, the added space down here, makes it so... Uh, the, the bottom, the, what's under the piston, can be less compressed because there's more space when it goes down. The top can't be less compressed. It's, it's kind of closed. In. Here, one side of the piston cylinder has a large buffer space, which allows for a relatively constant pressure on this side of the piston. Okay. Because if there wasn't the buffer space, then there'd be much more pressure on this side of the piston. Here, While the other side fluctuates in pressure due to all... And less up here. So much less fluctuation because you have the added space for the the gas or, or the air or whatever to go this side doesn't alternating heating cycles when heat is applied to the right so when it's less compressed it's not as hot but this side it, it can the outside of the cylinder and then when it's compressed it is hot and then heat applied to the outside the pressure increases causing the piston to move until the pressure equalizes yeah. now if we cool the outside of the cylinder with a heat exchanger the pressure will drop and once again the piston will move this is a basic pressure cycle to create mechanical work, but this is an insanely inefficient system as most of the energy we put into the system as heat is lost during the cooling cycle. Not to the gas, but the actual cylinder wall, which provides no mechanical work. Robert Sterling solved this by adding a displacer piston, which can drive the gas from mechanical loss during the cooling cycle. Not to the gas, but the actual cylinder wall, which provides no mechanical work. cycle not as most pressure side heat a piston to move until the pressure equalizes now if we cool the outside of the cylinder with a heat exchanger the pressure will drop and once again the piston will move so it's cool these things on the side are cooling the outside of the of the piston which doesn't affect the work done within the piston by these pressure areas on each side. This is our basic pressure cycle to create pressure will drop and once again the piston will move. This is our basic pressure cycle to create mechanical work, but this is an insanely inefficient system as most of the energy we put into the system as heat is lost during the cooling cycle. Not to the gas, but the actual cylinder wall, which provides no mechanical work. So why why add these these cooling things to the side? I, I, I. Robert Sterling solved this by adding a displacer piston, which can drive the gas. No mechanical work. So no mechanical work because it was being lost to the. Robert Sterling solved this by adding a displacer piston, which. So it's like another piston within there. Can drive the gas from one end of the cylinder to the other, allowing this end to be permanently hot and the other to be permanently cold. So the cylinder wall is no longer experiencing a temperature cycle. The pressure cycle here works slightly differently. First, the air on the hot end expands and causes the displacer to move into contact with the power piston, displacing more air from the cold end to be heated and expanded, allowing work to be done on the power piston. The air on the hot end now has nowhere to go and so is driven to the cold end, where it is cooled and contracts causing work to be done once again on the power piston. This is our new pressure cycle. The efficiency of this system can be increased further by placing what is essentially a heat battery in the tubes between the hot and cold cylinders. This conserves a huge amount of heat that would otherwise be wasted during the cooling cycle and gives the heat back to the air as it travels back through. Robert Sterling dubbed this the regenerator. Now we have the foundations of a useful engine. By incorporating a coolant system and a heating chamber... We why, why doesn't the heat up there travel through... 
create a larger temperature differential to drive the engine and the efficiency can be further increased by increasing the number of tubes connecting the hot and cold spaces along with the number of regenerators and adding fins to increase the surface area of these tubes to allow for heat transfer. Did I say simplified? Sorry, I meant easier to read. Maybe I like the misery. Stirling engines ultimately fell into obscurity as stronger steel became available to make steam engine boilers safer, but I've seen a resurgence in recent decades with the Gotland being the most famous implementation. The Gotland uses two Stirling engines that use diesel and liquid oxygen to provide heat, which in turn runs at 75 kilowatt generators. These generators can run an electric motor directly or charge batteries that can provide a huge boost in speed when needed. All the while the exhaust is compressed and stored on board, allowing the sub to stay submerged for up to two weeks, vastly longer than any other diesel powered submarine. So why is it so silent compared to other submarines? It doesn't require much explanation as to why an internal combustion engine using tiny controlled explosions for power tends to lead to some noise. What I, I heard a lot, a lot. Um, I, I know like whenever there are American submarines and you see pictures of American submarines uh, like in dry dock and out, they always have the propellers covered because that's a big... I, I guess the the design of the propeller is a giant factor in how loud um, a submarine will be, and therefore how detectable it will be. And, and I heard like that that like that like the Chinese submarines are like the loudest in the ocean, or was it the Russian? Uh, but combustion engine using tiny controlled explosions for power tends to lead to some noise. While the multi-billion dollar nuclear powered submarines need to pump huge volumes of coolant to their reactors to prevent a meltdown, causing enough noise to be detectable by passive sonar within a certain range. Really? On top of this, recently declassified intelligence suggests that Russian submarines are using these instruments to detect the faint trail of radiation left in the wake of these nuclear powered submarines, giving the Swedish submarine another way of avoiding detection. That's this is a fascinating genius are using these in top of this recently declassified intelligence suggests that Russian submarines are using these instruments to detect the faint trail of radiation left in the wake of these nuclear powered submarines, Damn. giving the Swedish submarine another way of avoiding detection. This is a fascinating application of the laws of thermodynamics. Understanding and applying the laws of science is the closest to a real-life superpower in this world. So why not unlock your superpower of understanding the universe by taking this course on astronomy on Brilliant? This course will take you from learning about the tools astrophysicists use to observe the universe through to the calculations that will allow you to peer into the future of the universe. Brilliant. I just want to say, guys, uh, uh, I'm, I'm going to go through the whole ad. Um, I, I feel extremely privileged to be able to watch these great, extremely well done videos and give my own reaction to them. And I love that that, that it's a. I, I really love doing it and everything, but I always want to make sure that when I'm using these other people's material, that I, I if the ads are a big thing, you know, that's how people generate revenue. And. Um, to if you're going to get anything and this gave you the idea oh brilliant might might be a good thing please click their link and use their promo codes it it makes it so <laughs> again so brilliant knows hey it's coming from here that helps them out I want to make sure you guys know that through to the calculations that will allow you to peer into the future of the universe brilliant is a problem solving website that teaches you to think like an engineer you can dive in and start learning about a huge range of topics starting from basic physics and working your way up to more complicated topics to support real engineering and learn more about brilliant go to brilliant.org forward slash real engineering and sign up for free the first 73 people to sign up with this link will get 20% off their annual premium subscription. I get to learn and solve these kinds of problems for a living and I love it. It gives me that warm glowy feeling inside when I finally conquer a difficult problem. Actively challenging your brain on a daily basis and getting that endorphin rush of a job well done is great for your mental health. Your brain hey, uh, that, that cycle, I remember learning about this. Evaporation. Condensation, precipitation, runoff. There's also transpiration, snowmelt runoff, surface runoff. On a daily basis and getting that endorphin rush of a job well done is great for your mental health. Brilliant even have an app where you can challenge yourself on the go. As always, thank you to my patrons and thank you for watching. If you'd like to join the real engineering community, I've recently set up a subreddit where we discuss everything engineering related and more. The link for that is in the description. Uh, really cool video. 
Who recommended that? To Melkor or was it? Who was it? And oh, that's a cool emote. I'm Mo. I'm Mo. I'm Mo. Mo Curly. Yeah, it was a really interesting video. Um, yeah, real engineering. I love watching stuff like this. Um, great video. How it's made too. I'd like to watch some some of those videos. Really interesting. Um, sorry. I mean, I, I'll, I'll let you know. I'll put something in to uh, skip over that part in the middle where I'm just trying to figure out how that piston worked, which and failed at doing it. Any engineers down there that can help me explain that? Uh, yeah, great video. Thanks for joining. Hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. See you next time.